Let's consider the organism Canis familiaris, also known as man's best friend, or the dog. Now, since prehistoric times, man has been slowly adapting wolves into the diversity of dog breeds that we see around us today. Dogs have been bred over countless generations for desirable traits and behaviors that were naturally written into their DNA. This type of human breeding intervention is referred to as artificial selection. And even though it takes a long time to occur, like the entirety of human civilization, the result is the creation of a GMO, or a genetically modified organism. Man has harnessed a natural built-in property common to all biological organisms, which is variability, and used it to artificially design dogs as an organism. Now, you might not categorize dogs as a GMO because most people equate GMOs with food, and you probably won't be sitting down to a roast dog dinner anytime soon. But you might eat a steak, maybe some bacon, a chicken leg, or a piece of fish, all of which come from domesticated animal populations that have similarly been bred and altered over time by man. I mean, when's the last time that you saw a cow or a chicken out in the wild trying to fend for itself? And this concept of artificial selection is true for plant species, too. This is the wild cabbage plant, Brassica oleraceae, which has been bred into cultivars so extensively over human history that we can recognize it today not only as white and red cabbage, but also as a dozen other staple crops, like broccoli, kale, kohlrabi, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and collard greens. The creation of genetically modified organisms through selective and artificial breeding has been around so long that oftentimes the ancient version of some modern foods wouldn't even be recognizable today. Take a look at corn's humble beginning, and think about the slow modified breeding that was necessary to yield that large ear of sweet starch that we know today. And the same is true for a multitude of crops, everything from wheat to apples. I mean, did you ever think about how you get a watermelon without any seeds? That would definitely be a poor reproductive strategy for nature to select. In more modern times, science has allowed us to accelerate this ancient process of genetic modification through artificial selection and breeding by using advances in genetic engineering instead. So when people talk about GMOs today, what they're really talking about are GE foods, or genetically engineered food products. A genetically engineered organism is one that's had its DNA altered or modified directly. And in most cases, these GMOs have been altered with DNA from a different organism, which could be a bacterium, a plant, a virus, or an animal. Now, these organisms are sometimes referred to as transgenic organisms, which are organisms that carry a gene from a completely different species. So that begs the question, how do you get a foreign gene into a different species? Now, the art of genetic engineering has changed significantly over the years. And as early as the 1920s, it was accomplished by inducing random mutations in crops using radiation exposure and hoping for novel or beneficial changes. Later on, bacterial transfer of small mobile bits of DNA called plasmids were used which is actually a common method of natural gene transfer in the prokaryotic world. Then came the mechanical insertion of DNA into the nucleus of a cell with the advent of gene guns. And even now, recombinant DNA technology and gene splicing techniques are changing how GMOs are currently made. The most extensive use of GMO technology is seen in large-scale agricultural crops. Between 85 and 95 percent of all the soy, canola, sugar beets, corn, and cotton produced in the United States have been genetically engineered. If you think about that list of commodity crops, consider how much GMO material must make its way into your processed foods in the form of extracted sugar, oil, or protein from those crops. An estimated 80% of all processed foods, from cereal to corn chips, canned soup to baby formula, and all processed foods in between contain at least one GMO. Not to mention that these crops also become the feed for the livestock that we consume. So how did this happen? Well, nowadays, genetically engineered crops come from large agricultural biotechnology and agrochemical corporations that spend vast amounts of money not only to develop and patent the GE seeds, but also to develop the pesticides and herbicides that can be used without killing those same GE crops. Now, one simple reason why people believe that GMOs are bad is because they believe that the companies that produce them are inherently evil. Let's take the example of Roundup, a weed killer produced by the company Monsanto. Now, this is a powerful herbicide that'll kill virtually any plant by inhibiting an enzyme. 
Now, conveniently enough, there's a bacterium that produces a similar enzyme that happens to be resistant to the chemical found in Roundup. Now, what the company did was engineer the bacterial gene into the crop so that crops and weeds could be sprayed indiscriminately and only the weeds would be affected. Sure, that's a good business model for the company, where you can market not only the herbicide but the seeds to farmers. But consider the ultimate goal. Without the need to till away weeds, you could produce more crops per acre with less water, less energy, and less soil loss. GMOs have been studied extensively for decades, and their use and consumption have been endorsed by many scientific organizations, like the American Medical Association, the World Health Organization, and the National Academy of Sciences all citing that GE crops pose no threat to human health when compared to their natural counterparts. In many ways, GMOs are beneficial. It was genetically engineered seeds that saved the Hawaiian papaya industry from being decimated by a virus known as the papaya ring spot virus. The seeds were engineered to carry a gene from that very same virus, which in a sense inoculated the plants and made them immune from infection. Or what about golden rice? which is a GE form of rice that's been enriched in vitamin A, an essential dietary component that's helping to combat childhood blindness in third world countries. So the goals behind GMO development are much more than just creating potatoes that don't bruise or apples that don't turn brown. GMOs have the potential to benefit mankind if they're used wisely, but that full potential can't be realized without thorough attention being paid to the risks associated with each new GMO on a case-by-case -case basis. So no matter what side of the GMO debate you fall on, just remember that science bonds us.